What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about intermittent fasting and muscle protein synthesis. But first, make sure you leave a comment, follow the algorithm, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and press the notifications button, I guess they say that makes a difference or maybe it doesn't make a difference, who knows? YouTube has a weird algorithm and just tends to do whatever the hell it wants. We're gonna keep pumping out that good content for you. So this week I'm discussing a new study that was published in the Journal of Obesity where they were looking at time-restricted eating versus regular kind of meal distribution and its effects on muscle protein synthesis. If you know anything about my background, I actually did my PhD looking at muscle protein synthesis in response to different feeding patterns. One of the criticisms of time-restricted feeding I had was that, you know, there's no real way to store dietary protein. People say, well, you store it in muscle. Not really. That's like saying a house is a storage place for wood. Yeah, you can get wood out of a house, but that's not why you build the house. Regardless, there's no real way to store protein. And so we know that it takes a certain amount of protein in a meal to increase muscle protein synthesis. We also know that there's a cap to the maximum anabolic effect of protein, depending on the source of protein, is anywhere from like 20 to 40 or maybe even 50 grams of protein at a meal. The idea is if you're shortening your feeding window, there's a longer period of fasting where muscle protein synthesis is gonna be depressed and that could lead to less muscle gain or even muscle loss. So this study was looking at time-restricted feeding versus a controlled diet where they were feeding in kind of a normal interval. So they took middle-aged men who were recreationally active but not actively engaging in resistance training and looked at a normal feeding pattern versus time-restricted feeding over the course of 10 days. Now, some of you may say, that's a really short time period. You can't really tell anything from that. It is short, but it's, long enough to get a good indication of what's going on with muscle protein synthesis. And this study had a very high level of control. So it was gonna be difficult to do over a long period of time. The first part is they actually provided all the meals to the participants, which is a very, very strong characteristic of this study because people in free living studies don't tend to follow what you tell them to follow. So by providing the meals, it takes out some of that lack of adherence that we usually see in dietary studies. The second part is they're using staple isotope technology and that is very expensive and very difficult to do over long periods of time when assessing muscle protein synthesis. So what they did was they used deuterated water, which is water with a heavy hydrogen on it. Basically, the hydrogen has an extra neutron which causes it to be heavy and you can trace where it goes in the body using something called a gas chromatography mass spectrometer. When you take tissue samples out of a person, you can see how much of this label has wound up in that tissue and compare it to other areas of the body. And basically through some really fancy science calculations, you can determine what the rate of muscle protein synthesis is based on how much of that label winds up in the muscle versus how much winds up in a precursor pool. So now the two different diets, the control group ate their meals at 8 a.m., 2 p.m., and then 8 p.m. So evenly distributed six hours between meals. The time-restricted eating group basically shortened their feeding window by two hours on each end. Breakfast was at 10 a.m., then lunch at 2 p.m., and then dinner at 6 p.m. So what did they find? Well, they found that muscle protein synthesis was not different between the groups. Now, my criticism of this would be shortening that feeding window by two hours on each end probably isn't gonna affect muscle protein synthesis. The other thing was the protein intake was relatively low. I mean, it was kind of the food guide pyramid recommendation of like 14% of calories from protein. So it's possible they might've seen differences if they used higher protein intake. Knowing what we know about the duration of protein synthesis in response to feeding, the muscle full effect, it's unlikely that shortening the space between meals from six hours to four hours is gonna make a massive difference when protein is equated between the diets. Additionally, it's important to point out that the researchers actually measured body composition as well. And they found something interesting. Even though calories were equated between the diets and protein was equated between the diets, they did see a greater loss of lean mass in the time-restricted eating group. They also saw more loss of body fat in the control group compared to the time-restricted eating group. And they saw a greater drop in body fat percentage in the control group versus the time-restricted eating group. 
they did not see a difference in the loss of body weight. Does that mean the time-restricted eating group lost more muscle. Not necessarily. All non-fat tissues register as lean mass. So it's possible there was other tissues that were being lost. But it is very interesting that they lost more lean mass. Now it wasn't a ton, but it was also only a 10-day study. They also showed that in spite of calories and protein being equal, there was slightly better blood glucose control in the time-restricted eating group. I don't really know how to explain that, just like I don't really know how to explain the differences in lean mass, even though protein synthesis was equal. I think this is one of those studies that's gonna raise more questions than it answers. I think the short nature of it makes it really hard to draw conclusions about the glucose data, as well as the lean mass and body fat percentage data. The body of evidence suggests that when calories and protein are equated, you don't really see differences in the loss of body fat or lean mass. So I'm not ready to take this one short-term study and say, see, time-restricted eating causes more loss of lean mass than you know, regular meal distribution. I don't think we can draw that conclusion from here. Just like I don't think we can draw the conclusion that time-restricted eating is better for blood glucose control based off this one study. Again, it was short-term and it was low subject number. There was only 18 total subjects. So I wanna be very careful about the conclusions we draw. And the low subject number is not a negative. You can only get so many subjects when you have such a high degree of control. And additionally, the more subjects they have, the more labeled water they need, and it's very, very expensive. These studies are constrained by their expenses. One other caveat is there was no resistance training done in this study. So perhaps it's possible the results might have been different if there was resistance training as well. So what are my personal recommendations around intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, muscle gain, and meal distribution? I think for your traditional kind of 16-hour fast, eight hour feeding window. If you're eating three meals during that time that have high quality protein in sufficient amounts, there's a couple studies from Dr. Grant Tinsley in resistance trained people that show at least in the short term, like over eight to 12 weeks, there's no difference in the accrual of lean mass between people doing intermittent fasting versus people not. We do see in studies that are more of the extreme fasting nature, like four hours feeding, 20 hours fasting, 22 hours fasting, two hours feeding, and alternate day fasting. Some of those we do see reductions in lean mass in people doing the fasting protocols. My personal opinion is that based on the body of literature, that your traditional kind of 16-8 is probably fine if you're looking to gain muscle, but the more extreme you go with fasting, the more likely you probably are to have some loss of lean mass. Do I think any form of time-restricted eating is optimal for accruing lean mass? No, I don't. There are really very few downsides to having more frequently distributed high-quality protein meals, but if you're somebody who likes to do intermittent fasting because it fits your lifestyle, or you find it to be a useful tool for fat loss, then the 16-8 protocol appears to be just fine and it's unlikely you're gonna see big differences in muscle mass between that versus a regular kind of meal feeding pattern. But if you want to be the most muscular person you possibly can be, which is a very small sliver of society, but does happen to include me, I would still say intermittent fasting is probably not the best protocol for that. All right guys, hope you liked the video, so make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you love these research breakdowns, make sure you check out my new research review, Reps. That's research explained with practical summaries. Every month we review five studies just like this one in fitness, nutrition, and supplementation. And we break it down in a way that's palatable and easy for you to understand. We tell you what the researchers tested, how they tested it, what they found, what it means for you, and if we agree with the researchers' conclusions based on their own data. It's a super useful tool and when you sign up, you not only get access to this issue, but all our previous issues as well. So it's a great repository for information to take your knowledge to the next level. So click the link in the description, check out reps, and I'll catch you guys next week.